Well, welcome to another Friday night. I'm glad you're back. Last week we start, or last month we started looking at what is trauma, and I looked at big T trauma and little t trauma, simple trauma, complex trauma, and hopefully you walked away with a, a clear understanding of trauma and that there's some really subtle forms of trauma that you might have, which results in a whole bunch of living things that can present problems in adult life. Today where I want to go is to the results of trauma. And if you were to go to the average program for being offered to people with trauma, what you would probably get is a program that focused on the physical results of trauma. So they would talk about if you become emotionally dysregulated, the startle response, the hypervigilance, and all of those are debilitating things for, to have to deal with in adult life. They can really mess stuff up. But I would say that that's not the most negative consequence of trauma. It's not in the physical stuff. It is in shame. It is in how it shapes our identity. So just so you know, we're going to get to that physical stuff. But I don't want to start there. I want to start with what I would consider to be the greatest negative consequence that comes out of trauma, and that is it creates a negative identity. I find it very interesting. We've had other programs, other agencies that have checked out our program, our material, and have basically said to me, we teach basically most of what you teach, all except for the shame piece. And I th always think, wow, you've missed the greatest negative consequence, the most far-reaching consequence of trauma. Now, this shame word is a really tricky word because it's a word that's not clearly understood. It's not a word that we talk about much in our culture. It is a word that most people don't understand. And, and so most people, when they hear shame, they think, oh, I don't have shame, when actually they are probably controlled by shame. They have tons of shame. It is just buried so deep or not even recognized because it's not been taught or understood, but it is running their life powerfully in a negative way. And so that is why I really want to take tonight to develop and help you understand what is shame so that you get a very clear picture of it and then you can begin to understand if you have it in your own life and how it's impacting you. Where most people begin when they think of shame is really the wrong start, starting point. They think of shame as an emotion. So they go, I feel ashamed, so that's what shame is, which is I feel embarrassed. Um, or shame on you, that emotion part of shame. So let's start with this, shame, yes is an emotion, but shame primarily is not about emotion. Shame is about a belief, a core belief about my identity. And it's that core belief that produces emotions if that belief is triggered. But shame is about a core belief about my identity that I'm not good enough, I'm not valuable, I'm not lovable, I have a negative identity. That is the core understanding of shame. So when you take the word, I feel ashamed or shame on you, what is actually happening there is there's blending of two concepts that are similar, that overlap, but are different, and that is shame and guilt. And that's where a lot of people get confused because they think shame equals guilt. So let me explain the difference. It's really important to understand it and then how they overlap. Guilt is about what I do, actions-wise. Shame is about who I am. So guilt is, 
a radar system inside of me that is triggered every time I do something that violates love. So I tell a lie, I'm unkind to somebody, I'm abusive, I feel guilt. It is saying what you have done is harmful, it is wrong. If you continue doing that, you're going to hurt your relationships, you're going to hurt yourself, you're going to hurt others. So guilt is a negative emotion that is to be a positive motivator to get back to living lovingly to doing things that are characterized by love. So guilt is a negative emotion that is designed to motivate me to resolve it, which means change my behavior. Shame is about who I am. Shame is basically saying I do not have value, I am not lovable, I am not good enough, I am less than. So what can happen in many complex trauma homes is parents can say, you did something bad, so you are bad. And they blend and confuse guilt and shame. So because you did bad actions, your identity is bad. But the problem with shame, it's this painful emotion, but the child can't resolve it. Because if I'm bad, how do I fix that? because I keep doing some bad things. And so now, guilt feeds shame. Every time I do something bad, I not only have guilt, I now go, oh, that proves I'm bad. And it feeds that negative identity. So that's where they overlap, that's where the one can feed the other. Now there's another piece that comes out of this in complex trauma, And it's false guilt, and it's a poorly trained conscience. And that's where a child is made to feel guilty for something they didn't do wrong. So dad says, I drink because you're such a bad kid. So now the child feels guilty every time their dad drinks because they think I've done something wrong. Or I'm angry and it's your fault. Well, dad might be angry because they did something that triggered his angry, but he's angry because of his stuff. But the child now feels guilty every time the parent has a negative emotion. It's my fault. My parent is going through that emotion or expressing that emotion that way. And so false guilt gets blended in and you can't resolve false guilt because you didn't do anything wrong but you feel guilty anyways, and that feeds into shame even more. So hopefully that helps you understand the difference between guilt and shame. Guilt about what I do, shame about who I am. So let's move into this topic of how does a child develop an identity? So subconsciously, a child comes into the world, who am I? That's the question. I don't have a clue who I am. And so, am I lovable? Do I have value? Do I matter to anybody? Does anybody delight in me? Do I have anything to offer? All of those are happening subconsciously in a child. How do they get an answer to those questions? They do it by, how do the significant people in my life treat me, respond to me? What do they say to me? So do I matter becomes, do I matter to them? If I don't seem to matter to them, then I don't matter. Am I lovable? Well, am I love to them, by them? Am I lovable to them? If I don't seem to be lovable to them, I must not be lovable. So they get the answers to those questions based on how mom and dad treat them. That becomes their basis of answering those questions. And so do you see all of those questions are identity questions. Am I lovable? Am I valuable? Am I desirable? Do I have anything to offer? Do I matter? How do mom and dad treat me? And what do they say to me 
That answers those questions. So if mom and dad neglect me, well, I guess I don't matter. And what happens then in the child's mind is, it's my fault. They don't have the ability to say, mom and dad have issues, it's their stuff, I have value. No, they go, the reason I'm being neglected is, I don't matter, it must mean I'm not valuable. And so they begin to form their identity based on how mom and dad treat them. So a a good metaphor for this is to think of a mirror. So a child comes in the world and they don't have a clue what they look like physically. How do they get the picture of how they look like? They look in a mirror and it reflects back to them a picture of who they are. A child comes into the world and they don't know who they are internally. How do they get a picture? They look at the mirror of mom and dad. And mom and dad reflect back to them a picture of who they are. But if mom and dad are messed up, they're getting a distorted picture back. And so what you begin to see is shame is a picture that a child develops about themselves that is all based on lies. It is based on distortions, but to the child, it's the truth. Because that's what, how mom and dad are treating them. So let me take that example further. I don't know how many of you have been to a house of mirrors where you go in and see all these distorted mirrors. So let's just imagine that you're six feet tall and very thin. And you walk into a house of mirrors and you look in the mirror and you're four feet tall and four feet wide. Okay, so take that picture and put that into a complex trauma family so that a child grows up and the only mirrors they have are distorted mirrors. And so every time they look in the mirror, they're four feet wide and four feet tall, when actually they're six feet tall and skinny. But every day they look into this mirror, four feet tall, four feet wide, that's all they see, that's the only picture they get back to them. And then one day they go to a friend's house who has an accurate mirror, and it shows them as six feet tall and skinny. What's going to go on in their head? Something wrong with that mirror. They're not going to question the mirror at home. They're going to question the friend's mirror because to them the mirror at home is the truth. And so what happens to a lot of people that come out of complex trauma with a distorted mirror that says, I'm not lovable, I'm not valuable, that's why I'm being abused, that's why I'm being neglected, it's my fault. They come into recovery and and they come and they meet somebody like you and you say to them, I'm getting to know you. You're a wonderful person. You just contradicted the mirror. So what's going on in their head? Ah, they're just saying that to be nice. They don't really mean it. They just discounted your message because it didn't match the mirror. Or they go, I wonder what they want. They got to be manipulating me somehow. That's why they're saying nice things to me. And so that core identity has been so reinforced over the years that now when you try to change it, you run into all these roadblocks that discount the truth because it doesn't match the core message. And that's the challenge in dealing with shame. So you could go to that person and go, Do you have value? And they could go out of their cortex. Yeah, I'm a wonderful person. But they're operating out of that old mirror that says I'm not lovable. And when they get into relationships, all of those things come out. They become people pleasers, perfectionists. And they do all kinds of things because they think if you get to know me, then you're going to treat me like mom and dad did. You're going to abandon me. You're going to neglect me. And so shame then governs how they approach relationships. So that's a little taste of what we're getting into. Some of you might be wrecked already, um, but let me take it further. Here's the key piece, I think, to put this into a picture for you. If you look at a child growing up in a home that is healthy, what identity are they going to walk away with? Their needs are consistently met. They're being validated, they're being nurtured, they're accepted for who they are, they're being loved, comforted when they're crying and all of that. They're being connected with by parents 
who want to be with them. When parents see them, their eyes light up. They go, I have value. I am lovable. I matter. They have a positive identity. That's the way it should be. And then they go into life with that positive identity. But what happens again? What comes when that doesn't happen? You get neglect and abuse? I guess I'm not lovable. I guess I'm not valuable. I guess I'm less than everybody else. And so then you have all the self-esteem problems that come out of that. So, we're going to go into the heavier part now and go through some of the causes. So what are some of these mirrors that send back to a child this distorted message that they interpret as their core identity, which is actually a shame identity. So we talked about any type of abuse. The child says, it's my fault. Um, I'm being abused because I must be bad. So physical abuse, verbal abuse, emotional abuse. Then you take a child that's put into Children's Aid Society, children that go through being adopted, children that go through a divorce, where all of a sudden they're separated and they feel somewhat abandoned. They feel, I guess I'm abandoned. I guess I was put up into ch children's aid or all of that because I'm not good enough. And, and if they're adopted, they might end up with wonderful parents, but deep down there's this haunting question of why did my original parents not want me? Why did they get rid of me? And they can know that the parents didn't have the ability to take care of them, but there's still this original message that says something must have been wrong with me. And so that is a powerful thing. So there's actually new studies coming out to study the effects of divorce that we're seeing so rampant in our culture. And more and more, all the tests are saying it's having way more effect on children than we thought as far as because of the trauma and the shame message that comes out of that. Then the neglect, we talked about that last time, the emotionally un unavailable. But it doesn't have to be necessary that parents just like their work more than their kids. It could be a parent who has a chronic illness and just can't be there for the kids. It could be parents who have mental health issues that just can't be consistently there. And so the, the children, they still interpret it that it's my fault. And they develop the shame message. Okay, now let me go into some new stuff here. If a child grows up in a home where every time they offer their opinion, it kind of gets laughed at, they begin to get the message, you're stupid. You don't matter. Your opinion doesn't matter. If parents roll their eyes, if brothers and sisters roll their eyes or snicker whenever they say something, it sends that message back to them. If they were told by parents or brothers and sisters, you'll never amount to anything, you can't do anything right, you're such a failure. That's a powerful, powerful message that shapes their core identity. Families that find humor at others' expense, teasing, name-calling, practical jokes, where the other person is always made to feel embarrassed, stupid, laughed at, that sends that message to them. Or you get families with kids come home with straight A's and one B, and the parents don't congratulate them for the straight A's, they go, how come you got a B? So it doesn't matter how good they try, how hard they try, it's never good enough in their family. They can never be good enough. And that sends the exact same message. Or parents that say, why can't you be like your brother? Why can't you be like your cousin? Comparing sends that message. Or like I talked about, you're blamed for your parents' problems. Dad says, I'm angry because you're such a bad kid. That's, it's your fault that I get angry. Not validated. Where you're, the child does lots of good stuff, but the parents are afraid we don't want to give them a big head, so we're not going to praise them too much. And so they're not given validation. They're not nurtured. Their needs aren't consistently met. The next one is huge. Children, when they're struggling or they're excited about something and they just want to connect with their parents and tell them about it or cry or get help, and they try to connect, but the parents aren't 
wanting to connect. That sends the message you don't matter. You're, you're not valuable enough to connect with. Or families where you can't express all your emotions. So you're going to keep crying, you're going to go to your room and don't come out till you got a smile on your face. If you're going to keep crying, I'm going to give you something to cry about. What that says to the child is there's parts of me that are bad. There's parts of me I have to hide, I have to hate because they make me undesirable. And that sends a shame message. Or parents that make promises and break them to the child's mind, it must be because I'm not good enough. That's why my parents keep breaking their promises. Flip side of all of that is you get the spoiled child, and you go, how could a spoiled child ever end up with shame where they're given gift after gift after gift, they're led away with stuff, they can do whatever they want. Do you want to know what the child wants? Don't try to buy my love, give me yourself. And if you're not going to give me yourself, then I don't feel valuable, regardless of the gifts you give. And if you cared enough, you would set boundaries for me. But the fact you set no, no boundaries and just let me do whatever I want, bottom, deep down, says you don't care. And they get the same message out of that. Conditional love, parents that give the silent treatment, parents that withhold love until the child does what they want, that sends the same message. Shame-based parenting, where if you do something wrong, it's not... The parent's response isn't just to correct it and to love you back. The parents have got to shame you. They've got to make you really feel bad. That sends the same message. Or you have parents who are all about their image. So their value system is money, things, the house, the car, how they look in public. And what the child is getting is that matters more than me because the parents put more energy into that than the relationship with me. And then, other possible causes. It's very interesting to me that studies have been done on children who bedwet. So about 10% of children bedwet um, pass kind of when they're potty trained. Of those who become addicts and end up with more severe trauma, that bedwetting goes on. And what often happens is the parents' response when they're exasperated with the bedwetting is they start to shame the child. They start to do things that put the child down, which feeds shame, which sets the child up for addiction because addiction medicates the pain of that shame. Families who are very poor, so everybody else at school has new clothes, they're always wearing hand-me-downs worn out clothes, they can't do other stuff. It's subtle, the parents may not control it, but the child is perceiving that even in society I'm not good enough. I don't make the mark. Children coming from a different ethnic culture who then come into a Canadian culture and they don't fit in, they don't feel understood, they're teased a little bit, that can send all of that. Or back in the day where there were big families, eight, ten children, Parents love those kids to death. They just had no time for them because they were worn out from taking care of all the others. So the child felt neglected like they didn't matter. So those are a whole bunch of things that can send the shame message. So this is your test this week. I'm going to do it with you. 42 questions. So I'm going to go through them. And you don't have a piece of paper. I just want you to mentally check off how many um, are true of you, and then we'll go see um, who gets the gold star. Okay, so these are all, if you're kind of, I think I'm getting what this shame is, I'm not quite 100% sure I get it yet. Hopefully this will really help you get it. Here's 42 ways shame works itself out, okay? How it shows up in adult life. So number one, have a rigid core belief I am bad, I'm weak, I'm unlovable, undeserving, inept, stupid, unattractive, powerless, worthless person. So that's like a deep core, very vocal belief deep down there. Second one is maybe more subtle that most haven't thought of, but 
excessively zealous, defensive, rigid, dogmatic. So a shame-based person feels, I'm stupid, I'm not good enough. So how do I, so shame always is looking for a way to compensate, to try to feel better about itself. So one of the things that shame will do is become extremely zealous, extremely rigid, black and white about everything. That becomes their way of appearing smart, appearing, I've got it. And so that can be a symptom. Habitual self-centeredness or egotism, constant belittling, discounting, criticizing, and this goes in two directions. You constantly put yourself down you got an inner critic in your head that's constantly challenging your motives putting yourself down you're stupid you just blew it you can't do anything right or you're quite critical of others so that is a shame actually symptom repeatedly choose menial jobs below personal capabilities avoid responsibilities excessively so that is a key part of how shame can Work out. So another way to say that is shame can go, I'm going to become super responsible, that's going to be my way of compensating, or I'm going to be irresponsible. Because why try anything, I'm going to fail anyways. So let's just avoid taking on responsibility, because I'm only going to fail. Okay, next one, addiction. And so that is not just substances, but it can be fat, sugar, carbohydrates, or like we talked about last time, activity addictions. Um, which work, spending, gambling, pornography, working out, or relationship type addictions, codependency, or emotional states, addicted to emotional state. So you need to be angry to feel alive, to have energy. You live chasing the next excitement, drama and chaos. You're chasing sexual stuff all the time, or that can even go into chasing spiritual ecstasy experiences all the time. So you're trying again to compensate. Seven, this is a big one that often gets praised, but it can be predominantly a shame one from issue for many people, a compulsion to rescue needy or disadvantaged others. Championing, identifying with underdogs. So shame is basic. So love says, I want to help needy people. Shame says, I want to help needy people. They both look the same. What's the difference? Love's motive is totally different than shame's motive. Love is, I want to help you, but take care of me. Shame says, I don't like me. I need you to like me in order for me to like me. So I'm going to help you so that you like me. That's going to fix my shame. So I'm going to give and help needy people in order to get the praise, the validation I never got earlier. Motivation, totally different. Actions look the same. So that is, is a big issue. Another one, avo- habitually avoid eye contact or are apologetic or defensive about that. Excessive social isolation or compulsion to socialize and be the center of attention. So shame says I'm a terrible person. Anybody that gets to know me is going to abandon me or reject me, so I'm going to isolate. And that can be geographically. I just don't want to be around people, or I'm going to build all kinds of walls around my heart and let nobody close. That's that kind of isolation. Or I need to be the center of attention. That way I get everybody fixing my shame for me by giving me positive attention. So I can't give myself healthy validation. I need others to do it, so I have to be the center of attention. Number 10, having few or no real friends or being consistently drawn to other wounded, needy companions and partners. So what happens when I work with couples all the time with trauma? They go, I go, why were you attracted to each other? And they always go, oh, they were good looking or we had lots of things in common. You want to know why they're probably really attracted? Shame attracts shame. And that was the basis of it. And as I begin to help them understand that, it's mind-blowing for them. But what I want them to realize is if you get a divorce and you don't deal with your shame, guess what? 
you're going to go find somebody else with just the same amount of shame and start all over again. And so you're going to be attracted to other people with the same amount of shame. Number 11, a general suspicion and mistrust of other people, even when they're trying to be nice, which is that story when somebody says, wow, I really like you, you're amazing, and you're not trusting that. Excessive sensitivity and defensiveness to perceive criticism or rejection. So I ask clients all, all the time this. If I was texting you, and all of a sudden you texted me and you didn't get an, a text right back. Maybe I had to go to the washroom, maybe somebody showed up at my door and I had to go answer it, but you didn't get an answer right back, what would go on in your head? They go, you must be mad at me, I must have done something wrong. Hypersensitivity to anything that might be perceived as criticism, even though nothing bad's happened at all. You just made it up in your own head. That's your shame being triggered and trying to create its own reality. Excessive concern with personal and so social blame and fault finding. So a lot of shame-based people get very wrapped up in kind of social injustice stuff, but to an extreme that is unhealthy for them. Often perceiving neutral feedback as criticism and are wrongly assuming unspoken criticism. So they're reading criticism into stuff that people are saying, even just general feedback. Feeling irrationally guilty and are anxious about earned successes. So if you're, you've succeeded at something and people are praising you and validating you, you're feeling guilty but you're feeling like an imposter. Because, oh, if they only knew the real me, they wouldn't be saying that. And so you begin to feel like this fraud every time anything good happens, that you don't deserve this, that you, you don't earn this. Obsessing about my rights, or I don't deserve, or obsessing about equality fairness stuff, Endlessly focusing on past mistakes that you've made. Stuff that caused your shame to be triggered. You can't get let go. You just keep going back and reliving it and reliving it and beating yourself up each time. Habitually putting your own opinions, needs, and welfare last. Now this is another one that gets praised in a lot of places because then you're thought to be very loving and selfless because you sacrifice so much. But the problem is you're not taking care of yourself. You, so you're trying to keep pouring water out of the cup, but the cup's getting empty and it becomes empty and you never stop to take care of that. But you just always put everybody else's needs ahead of your own and then you feel guilty for having needs. So that becomes very much a key shame characteristic. Having an unreasonable fear of failing losing or making mistakes so you're asked to do something and it just sends you into huge anxiety fear that you're going to fail or you can't admit when you've made a mistake or you compulsively apologize all the time because you're pretty sure you did make a mistake or you habitually unflatteringly inappropriate sloppy clothing so you just don't take care of yourself very well because you don't think you're worth taking care of very well. Obsessive concern with personal, professional, social vehicle, or dwelling appearances. So you go to the other extreme. I'm useless on the inside, but if I make a great image on the outside, then maybe people will respect me. Because if they get to know the real me, they'll never respect me. So the only way I'm going to get respect is be all about image. And so some go that route. And that leads to compulsive perfectionism. So it's not just that I want to live by doing the best I can. It's I got to be perfect for people to love me, respect me, and see me as valuable. And so you drive yourself by an unrealistic expectation of you have to always be perfect. And so it's usually that person is always living by 
I should be doing this, shoulds. I should have, I should have, I should have. And it's, the bar is always higher than they're able to attain, but they're not willing to see that the bar is actually unhealthy. So that's a shame characteristic. Rarely buying anything nice or special for oneself or taking fun trips or vacations. And so again, not treating yourself as special because deep down you don't feel yourself as special. Compulsively shading the truth or lying directly or by omission and denying it to avoid expected ridicule, criticism, or disapproval. So I need to lie so you never get to know what's really going on deep inside of me because if you got to know the truth of that, you'd reject me. So I will do all kinds of lie, deflect stuff. Notable self-neglect, resisting or avoiding medical care, never seeing a doc, rarely seeing a doctor, dentist, gynecologist, eye specialist, checkups, not getting or taking prescribed medication and poor personal hygiene. 27, avoiding self-assessment for psychological wounds. So again, ah, oh, I don't need help, I just need to get over it. I'm not worth that extra work. Choosing unhealthy diets or bad habits, lack of exercise, toxic environments, um, and then joking about that. Deflecting, discounting, or rejecting deserved compliments, being very hard on yourself, we talked about that. Chronically giving time and energy to others, but giving little or nothing to yourself in return or not receiving it from others very well. Repeatedly choosing, justifying, and tolerating relationships, situations, and environments which are not healthy. That one is huge. Because what you're saying is this. I don't treat myself with respect, so why should I demand that others treat me with respect? So I will allow others to use me and abuse me. I won't stand up for myself because I'm not deep down not worth standing up for. Being unable to do this self-love exercise. Repeatedly taking risks that result in self-harm, humiliation, and loss of self and social respect. Denying or justifying an act of addiction is a common example. So you get some people that go, I'm not worth much. I'm not worth anything. But I'm not willing to kill myself. But I'll flirt with death. And if I die, okay. But that's how I'm going to live. Take risks. Because deep down it's a shame thing. 34, rarely requesting or demanding what you want. So having trouble saying, I need this or I want this, doing so anxiously, expecting to be rejected rather than calmly asserting yourself, tolerating and or justifying a core belief like I don't deserve or expect success, love, security, comfort, friends or nice things. So you talk yourself into that you don't deserve it or expect it. Being timid, passive, quiet, reserved, aggressive, self-centered, or a bully. So I'm an introvert. I, I'm, a, I'm an extreme introvert. I, I, I could be quite happy talking to one person once a day for five minutes and the rest of the time being by myself. Um, I, I'm great with that. That's not what I'm talking about by being timid, quiet, reserved. Shame is I can't let anybody get to know me. So I'm going to go into a shell to protect other, myself from others getting to know me. So shame's impulse is I must hide. And that is where their timidity and reserves comes from. Or every kid that's a bully, massive shame. Why? Now I need to compensate for how I really feel, which is I feel less than. So I will compensate by trying to act greater than everybody. And so a bullying is shame working itself out by looking for somebody they perceive as weaker that they can dominate. And that they're looking as a solution to their shame. Next one is massive, not setting or enforcing healthy boundaries with yourself and others. So afraid to say no to people. 
who ask you for stuff. Self-sabotage. So as soon as life is starting to go well, something deep down is going, I don't deserve this. Or it's all going to fall apart because I'm a failure. So let's just sabotage it now. Get it over with. So you destroy the good stuff that's happening in your life. Frequently choosing long-suffering victim, saint, or martyr roles in key relationships and social settings and not questioning why. So you look at people that are in abusive relationships. The abuser has tons of shame. The person taking the abuse has tons of shame. They're just responding differently. But the person who's taking it, they're portraying in their own mind Oh, I'm such a martyr. Look how loving I am to take all this. And they're putting it, trying to put a positive spin, but deep down, they feel I deserve it. I can't get anything better than this. It's better to have a few crumbs of love than no crumb, than no love at all. Because that's what I would get if I tried to get a good person, is nobody would want me. So let's settle for a few crumbs than no love at all. Okay, three left. Choosing direct contact, human service profession like clergy, counseling, medicine, education, law enforcement, consulting, coaching, training, driving, public vehicles, customer service, casework. Now, don't misunderstand me. Not everybody that does that has shame as their motivator. Some have love as their motivator. But many have shame as their motivator. That's why they do it. Shame anxiety is... I don't want to put myself out of my comfort zone because I might fail, and that'll trigger my shame. So I'm afraid of getting more shame, so now I have anxiety about getting more shame. And then the last one, frequently reliving traumatic memories from the past that cause shame. Okay, let me just end with this, and then we'll take a break. So you can see that core identity then becomes an emotion. This is what I believe about myself. That leads to how I feel towards myself. And it's not good. But it also brings with it other emotions. And they're all negative. They're all painful. So shame doesn't produce one positive thing. Shame only brings a truckload of negative. So it brings fear. So shame is primarily a fear emotion. Fear that if you get to know me, you're going to reject me. Fear that everybody will abandon me. It's fear, fear, fear. So that brings with it deep insecurities and anxiety. So many people with anxiety disorders, it's a shame issue. That's why they have so much anxiety. It brings depression. My life sucks. I'm useless. I, can't, I don't amount to anything. I'm a failure. That's depressing to live with that core belief. And so that leads to self-hatred, beating yourself up in your mind all the time, putting yourself down. Every time you fail, you've got to flog yourself and punish yourself. That's shame stuff. Then there's anger that comes with that. Then it leads to jealousy because if you're in a relationship, you're afraid that the person you're with, somebody, they're going to get attracted to somebody else. After all, you're not much of a catch. So now you have jealousy all the time. That leads to envy. Everybody else seems to have it better than me or is doing better than me. That leads to being negative and critical about all kinds of things. And all of that just leads to this deep discontentment. Because what the problem is, is now you have no joy on the inside because your core belief says you're unlovable. So your only hope of any happiness is external. Realize how backwards that is? But that's what happens when your core belief becomes negative is now you're dependent on joy. You don't even know joy. It's just I need some pleasure from external circumstances. And then there's a hopeless or discontent, but a hopelessness that sets in. I can't fix this. What's the point? It's very distressing. So all of that negative, negative, negative and so what happens for people is if they're in a situation where their shame gets triggered part of why they fear their shame gets triggered 
is it's not only going to bring the feeling that I'm not good enough or I'm less than, it's going to bring hopelessness. It's going to bring anger. It's going to bring all those other emotions. And so it's only going to be then result in being teased, being laughed at, being punished. It's just going to bring a whole bunch of more bad stuff. So it's a painful, painful thing. So I told you it was going to be heavy. Hopefully it gave you a whole bunch of light bulbs. So next time, I'm going to show you a whole bunch of ways in more detail about how this changes relationships in very negative ways. And it changes how we go about life.